Open the pod bay doors now. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Lisa Marie Napoli, and I am Associate Director in the Political and Civic Engagement Program here at the College of Arts and Sciences on campus. And I'm, I'm very honored to be able to have this opportunity to introduce tonight's uh, important film. Um, as part of the Science on Screen series here at the IU Cinema, um, the film, This Changes Everything, is inspired by Naomi Klein's book and is directed by Avi Lewis, as you probably already know. As we know, <laughs> climate change is no small topic, <laughs> and it requires a vast interdisciplinary lens to really begin to grasp its scope. Exploring the topic can be sometimes a range of emotions. It can be sometimes frightening, um, enlightening, motivating, confusing, or somewhere in the middle there. Um, but no matter how we look at it, it's, it's an important film. And the film that we are about to watch, it takes us on an exploratory journey. It's, over, it's filmed over a four-year period of time in nine countries. And we get the opportunity, as we view it, to explore connections uh, between what Naomi Klein talks about in terms of the state of the carbon levels, what appears to be the state of the carbon levels, and in our atmosphere that's sort of above and beyond us, to the grounded economic system that we exist in and where those connections lie in between. And it's through this intersection at looking at our more you know, complex ecosystem with the economy and the atmosphere, um, by reviewing it, perhaps we can gain a better sense of the complexity of what some people refer to as a, a very wicked problem because it's so complex in its nature. So we're all here together on a Friday night after a full cold and sunny week. <laughs> and I encourage you to sit back and relax and enjoy the presentation of this information tonight. Um, I hope it allows us to think about things in perhaps a more holistic manner and uh, possibly stretching the way we see things already. Uh, after tonight's film, we have the pleasure of having some panelists here this evening. Uh, we have a terrific panel lined up, thanks to Brittany and others. Um, and we'll be able to uh, have a little discussion following the film if any of you are able to stay for that. So for now, please uh, turn off all electronic devices and put them deep in your pocket or whatnot. And uh, let's uh, enjoy our time together to view the film. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for staying and joining us for an important discussion. We have a very uh, striking and powerful baseline of watching the film together to begin our conversation tonight. Um, it will be a, a bit of a short and sweet time together since there is a film at 9.30 and we have a certain time to wrap it all up, but it looks like we have a good solid 30, 35 minutes to have a, a great discussion. I thought a wonderful way <laughs> thank you, um, to um, begin is to uh, first let's have the panelists introduce themselves so you have have a sense of uh, the expertise and the, the committed um, interests and research of the, the folks we have here tonight. So if we could start with you, Jessica. Sure. Hi, I'm Jessica O'Reilly. Um, I'm in International Studies. I'm an environmental anthropologist. I, um, I'm interested in sort of uh, cultural processes at the borders between science and policy. And so I work in Antarctica, and I work in the uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Treaty System to do my ethnographic research. I'm Stephen Masakira. I'm a historian in the Department of International Studies here, and I um, write about the history of environmental politics and environmental policy around the world. 
Hello, I'm James D'Amico. I'm in the Literacy, Culture, and Language Education Department, and I'm interested in uh, what does it mean to be literate about climate change and doing a different research studies around that. My name's Jeff White. Uh, I'm an environmental science faculty member in the School of Public and Environmental Affairs with a, an appointment in geological sciences as well. And for nearly 30 years, I've been working on climate change science, uh, focused on greenhouse gases and greenhouse gas emissions from landscapes, uh, focused primarily in uh, Arctic landscapes. Hi, I'm Stephanie Kane. I'm also in international studies. I study water, water infrastructure, water ecology, water in cities. I'm about to start a project in the Arctic on um, law and how law doesn't understand ice. Um, and I look at geoscience as a kind of cultural model. That's kind of the approach I'm building on right now. So in terms of our structure for this evening, um, I'd like to get started, get us warmed up a little bit with a, a question or two for the panel. And then I'd like we will open it up to all of you. So as you're sitting there, you may want to be thinking about what, what hits you and what you'd like to ask our panel tonight. So one of the themes of the film seem to be this idea of what story is being told in our culture and our society. And I thought um, a nice first question for you all would be to hear a little bit about more about your stories and the work that you do to get a way to get to know you a little bit more and to begin our um, discussion here tonight. So what I'm curious about is what struck you most about the film tonight and how does that relate to your work? Maybe something that you found challenging, surprising, you know, what was it that struck you? And, and we don't have to go in any certain order, but I would love to hear from all five of you, if possible, if you'd like to, to briefly respond to that question. Who would like to begin? I can go. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Yeah. Thank you. I don't mean to replicate the order. Um, <laughs> so as an environmental anthropologist, uh, I've always been interested in the cultural relationships between humans and the environment. Um, and so I really loved that um, uh, Naomi Klein's writing in this film um, take indigenous perspectives, for example, really seriously. Um, I'm also really interested in scientists and their um, relationships with the environment and how they see that. Um, I, I really love to assign uh, Naomi Klein's work in my class for the first week um, when I teach about climate change because she really does, she doesn't strike a, a, a conciliatory tone at all. Um, she, she's not afraid to um, tell everybody, including people who work on climate change as their careers, that they're being denial, the climate deniers um, by the way that we, we so easily look away from these problems. So she's really good at um, making me feel guilty and making the student sort of productively guilty even if they, if we're feeling sort of great about what we're doing um, and and I like that it's good to have that sort of uh, strong strong kick oh I'll jump in thank you Stephanie <laughs> I um, study activists a lot in my work because in, in in a lot of places you go and there's gorgeous laws about protecting the water and the environment and no one ever implements them or really pays attention to them and and breaks them at will until people in local communities come out and 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 fight to make the government do their job um, and follow their own laws um, what struck me about this film was that um, the relationship between the state, which was kind of missing, and um, the you had these, she stitched together these clashes around the world, these, these clashes where in these spaces where enclaves were kind of butting up against sacrificial zones. And between the local people and the industry were always the mili militarized cops, right? Militarized police. And that was completely missing from the analysis from her stories, right? And that's, and, I, and if I were to try to work on this, that's where I would go because we really need to understand how is it that the, the, the um, people who are assigned to protect us are the ones who are fighting us and everybody else is kind of invisible behind closed doors. 
Uh, I'll jump in too. Um, you know, I work on the science aspects of this and have been for, well, 35 years or so and uh, started in the acid rain business, if you want to consider it that way. Um, and the storylines here are just exactly the same. Nothing has changed. We're doing the same things over and over again with the same battles. This one's bigger, um, no question about it. But uh, what struck me about the film is this seems like it's just a replay of things I've seen over and over and over again. Yeah, I want to build on that. Um, I think one of the, the strengths of the film for me is that um, it helps us understand climate change is not just a science issue. I mean, it's a socio-scientific issue, and there's lots of perspectives that the film brings to bear on understanding what climate change is and how to respond to it. Um, there's a really clear historical perspective, providing historical context. There's an economic perspective. There's a sociological perspective. Um, psychological, when we think about denial, what that is. Um, and that's a comprehensive way of thinking about c climate change. So, um, and I'm in education, so from an education starting point, understanding climate change as a complex, multifaceted topic, as, as Lisa Marie introduced the film as such, is a really important starting point. Um, so the science is still central to it, obviously, that's why we're talking about climate change, um, but it's not a science issue solely. So a, a couple things stood out to me and relates somewhat to what we're saying here. The first is about the sources or origins of environmental ideas or an environmental ethos. Uh, there are many different ways in which people come to um, have what we might think of as an environmental outlook. Uh, the most common story that we're told is that of the John Muir, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, go into the woods to find some kind of spiritual redemption from the fallenness that is industrial society. Um, and that tends to be a very elitist story. It tends to be a story of um, sort of wealthy people who have reached a certain level of development. There's a kind of stages thinking implied in that. But what this film um, suggests is that there are many other different ways in which one can come around to environmental ideas. And those uh, ways of coming around to environmental ideas can form or inspire different forms of activism. And so in this film, it could be the goat farmers waking up one day and seeing oil in their yard, right? It could be um, a coal plant coming down on someone's territory, uh, an indigenous population's territory, and the very sort of threat to their lifestyle um, inspiring environmental action. And so I think that's valuable as well to sort of understand the diversity of sources of environmental ideas. And then as a historian, one thing I appreciated, but was also struck by is that there was a little slippage in um, Klein's sort of ultimate villain in the story. At times it was capitalism, which was often expressed in very vague terms. It was not clear what capitalism was here. Um, and at other times it was growth, um, which are not the same thing. Uh, from a historian's perspective, that what is really distinctive about the 20th century is not necessarily the rise of capitalism, but the extent to which the notion of economic growth and the centrality of economic growth to every political regime's legitimacy um, came to define the world, right? Economic growth was the preoccupation of the Soviet Union just as much as it is uh, the capitalist world under austerity. And um, that suggests that rather than any sort of particular type of economic system, there's a broader ideology at work about how we understand the future, our relationship to the future, and also how political power understands and legitimizes itself to its citizens um, and, and to the industries that make it up. Well, I feel each of you has opened up a pathway to go down, um, and uh, I'm sure it stirred a lot of thinking for, for all of us here tonight. Um, I was going to sort of pick one of those paths and go down it, but I think I'll just ask my second question that I had already planned, and then we could just keep exploring these um, really mind-opening inroads that you brought our attention to. So thank you all. Um, so I'm curious. Um, especially after hearing um, President Trump speak on Tuesday evening to Congress, um, you know, with recent changes in our federal administration, um, many citizens are expressing fear and uh, protest, as we saw in the film that has been going on for years, um, about the negative environmental impacts uh, as a result of policy decisions. And I think the, the most recent and perhaps most shining light example we could look at is the, the Dakota Access Pipeline. 
um, and the, the go-ahead of, of President Trump recently that he's speaking about. Um, so I'm curious about what are your thoughts about the situation and the potential implications um, of government policy making in this way? It's not an easy one. <laughs> Uh, just to, I think one of the um, interesting aspects of that decision, if we sort of take a step back and think about the stories we tell ourselves, um, is that you know one of the stories we tell ourselves is this march of material progress and abundance. Um, another story um, that we might have told ourselves is that the environmental movement is gaining sort of inevitable traction as people sort of become more informed about the nature of climate science and. Um, there was a tendency to look at, say, the past 20 or 30 years as um, a really remarkable um, reaction to um, economic growth and its environmental consequences. But as the film implied with the rise of climate denialism, which was not really present in our, our politics before um, the late 1990s and really the early 2000s, uh, and also the recent decisions by the Trump administration suggest that um, you know, we should not be too sanguine or optimistic in the faith that sort of environmental protection will necessarily flow from the availability of deeper and more effective um, science. That's kind of what Jeff was suggesting when you know, we had a really good understanding and really effective political mobilization around acid rain in the late 1980s, um, but yet that did not necessarily by itself lead to um, the collective action on the scale that this film implies we need. Stephanie. I think for those of us who are concerned about what's going on, um, it's becoming more dangerous and tense, and um, it's hard to know how to use one's energy, where, where to put it. Um, whether you know you should be making calls all day, or you know you should wait for that that big event, that next that next big event, you know that next big confrontation. I I in my work, it's it seems like it's really the activists who do the 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 drudge work, you know, carry it on in between the big events that really can accomplish things. And I I wonder how we can do that, how we can. Um, look around us and figure out ways to connect with the people in, the, in, in our region, for example, who don't relate to us. Um, I don't know if you all saw in the paper the other day, but uh, there was a message that got sent out to the 6,000 employees of Crane that um, they should be on guard because there was going to be a violent protest, a potentially violent protest in Bloomington. And, and that was written up in the paper as if it went, the, the, whoever the spokesperson was said, well, why is that a problem? We always send out things like this. It's, it's just, it's benign. Well, those kinds of things, I, I, I think, are kind of the underbelly of the environmental stuff. We need to start talking in ways with, pe with people that we don't usually talk to and not wait for those big events. Um, so I uh, flew on election day to the to Morocco for the uh, United Nations the, for the big climate change conference COP uh, 22, where the plan was to figure out how to implement the Paris Agreement that they had put into place um, the year before. And I, I landed, and we I heard the results as I was getting off the plane, and the meeting was very different in tone. It had been very optimistic in Paris and. In Marrakesh, uh, for a moment, people were like, <gasps> um, but it was really interesting to see uh, everyone get their feet under them. Um, and, and the activists and the, the non-governmental organizations, uh, people were, were the first up. And I can't help but continue to feel optimistic um, with, with, with that kind of energy behind it. There were. Um, indigenous people from all over the world. There was a, a Dakota Pipeline Day of Action um, in Marrakesh, and uh, I remember a young uh, uh, Cana uh, First Nations Canadian woman standing there in the venue saying, we have dealt with Donald Trump's for centuries. Um, mm -hmm. And the NGOs were so nimble to pivot towards China for climate leadership. Um, so I think um, even though we have a challenging short-term policy landscape in the United States, 
Um, there's a lot of capacity locally and internationally um, that that wasn't here, you know, in in 2001, for example. Um, uh, and so I, I I continue to feel hopeful that there there are still a lot of people um, moving things forward. Could I just quickly uh, jump in? I think um, to your point, uh, the the recent political. Uh, actions here in the U.S. are energizing, in fact, um, tremendously across the world. We're going to see that play out, and I hope the staying power to it. Thank you. James or Stephen, would you like to? Okay. Okay. Um, so let's do a little time check. So um, I'll, anyone bursting with a question, or shall I ask one more? Okay, great. Someone's bursting. <laughs> Okay, so the question was about growth and how does population growth affect climate change issues? And what was your last part? Was there one last part? That was, basically it. That was it. Okay. Who would like to respond to start? Stephen's. Yeah, you know, okay. you take that. <laughs> Stephen, please. <laughs> well, so, um, I'll, uh, you know, I'm a historian, and so I'll answer this as a historian would, which is to look to the past and to say that. When the environmental movement was breaking on the scene um, into mainstream politics in the 1960s and 1970s, there was a particular strand of it that was very focused on population growth and, by extension, population control. And um, there were really a lot. There was really alarmist rhetoric surrounding the expectations of how the population would continue to grow worldwide over the course of um, the 20th. Uh, century into the 21st century um, based on uh, some projections that turned out to be totally and wildly off base. And in retrospect, um, it was clear that a lot of that rhetoric was infused with deep racial um, and social anxieties across the board. The Sierra Club actually published this really remarkable book in the 1950s called This is the American Earth. And um, it's a really fascinating book of photography because there are images of Yosemite and sort of beautiful American national parks. And then there'll be an image of um, the Ganges River with um, sort of bodies upon bodies implying that, you know, third world countries are um, reproducing at a rate that is going to sort of starve the beautiful national parks in the United States, which was rife with all sorts of, um, you know, totally misguided assumptions about um, other people. And so that is. Just to say that um, you know many of the concerns animating those who were concerned about population growth and in favor of population control control in the late 1960s were not really borne out. That's not to say that populations did not continue to grow, but certainly not on the scale that they did. And um, there was actually a big debate in the environmental movement at the time about um, whether the solutions pointed to by focusing on population control were so invasive and so anti-democratic, um, sort of forced sterilization and, and so forth and so on, that they would ultimately be counterproductive in terms of building the kind of political alliances necessary for meaningful change in the long term. That's my shot at the population question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank well, you. <laughs> Anyone else want to comment? Okay, uh, I'll jump in with a question, then I want to turn it back to you all again. Um, so uh, my background is in conflict resolution, and oftentimes it's that binary thinking of right and wrongness, and this behavior is bad, you know, that black and white binary thinking that sort of leads to these issues becoming stuck. And so uh, one thing that I appreciated about this film at the end when you know we're looking at the film and there is a lot of combative times and it is uh, in many ways a, a black and white sketch that we see um, that that can limit our thinking about the topic but in the end you know rather than looking at it as a crisis she poses the question perhaps it's a real opportunity for us and perhaps that's more of that energizing energy that Jeff you were just referring to as well in terms of how people are moving and responding to these issues so I'm curious in that spirit of hope <laughs> that Jessica was talking about as well. Um, where, what do you all think about uh, what what can move us forward? Where is the opportunity in this rather devastating um, scene and story that we just viewed tonight? I'll, 
take a stab at that. <laughs> Thank um, you. By telling a little story. Uh, today, earlier, um, I, w I went to a panel discussion uh, in SPIA, actually, that involved several uh, representatives of several large uh, energy companies. Um, and of course, uh, you might think they'd come in really guarded about what they might be able to say. The me message was very clear to me that they have been moving very aggressively to plan toward um, major renewable energy portfolio development. And it's an international effort on these, the part of these companies, and they're really pushing for putting a price on carbon and trying to develop uh, free market techniques that would allow us to rapidly move toward uh, renewable energy uh, sources. So this surprised me. I didn't realize um, to what extent that's permeating uh, some of the largest energy companies here in the U.S., and we're actually f behind uh, certainly other countries around the world. So that, to me, is quite encouraging. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, along those lines, um, just seeing I, the energy transition is happening, um, and uh, it, I think it just remains to be seen based on policy, policy decisions and incent incentives that um, uh, our lawmakers can put together. Um, it remains to be seen if this transition is going to be full of suffering or if it's going to be relatively easy. Um, I think that's sort of where 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 things can turn right now. Um, but I mean, the price of solar internationally is really close to parity with uh, polluting power sources. We're seeing coal-fired power plants shutting down um, all over the United States, uh, and I hope that there's a resulting sort of attempt at economic development in, in coal regions that will suffer um, and are, have been suffering for quite a while with automation and the decline of coal. Um, uh, investments in renewable energy are increasing. It's just, you, it's, it's happening. It already is happening. Um, and I, I'm seeing a shift too. I know, you know, our uh, current national sort of policy scene looks tilts a little to the, not even explicit climate denial, but the sort of soft acceptance of climate change, accepting the reality of it, but perhaps saying it's not the most urgent issue. Um, but you're seeing, um, I was just looking at data from Pew Foundation, and they, about which parts of our country uh, accept the reality of climate change and acknowledge that it's uh, the scientific consensus that it's caused by humans. And you really see Florida, for example, lighting up, um, which isn't, you know, it's not California, it's not New York. Um, and I think with, with people actually experiencing the effects of climate change, um, the, 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 piece, the transition's just gonna fall, in, fall into place in a bipartisan way. Yeah, I guess I'd like to, to um, <laughs> respond about shift and change in a, maybe a different way in, in a kind of a, maybe a smaller scale. Um, some of the work we've been doing is um, creating conditions for teachers and future teachers to have conversations about climate change. In particular, um, future teachers who have different beliefs about climate change across the spectrum, from denialists to alarmists. And what happens when they sit down and look at different websites that have different perspectives about climate change? And it's been heartening to um, first see, first, this is something they don't do. They don't necessarily, at least the groups we've worked with, they don't think about or engage with climate change. It's not part of their everyday um, reality in terms of what they care about or, or what, they, what sources and information, movies and so forth that they take in. So as a starting point, just having the creating the conditions for them to have these conversations. But then what happens across that, especially when we open up to the whole group, we start, um, and they start kind of naming what those assumptions they have about climate change are, what they might be, and to just get a, uh, an increased awareness of how they're, why they're thinking about these sources about climate change in particular ways. So the importance of, of dialogue across the spectrum of beliefs is, I think, part of this kind of smaller shift. We need to have those opportunities to kind of think through how we make sense of these really complex texts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say along those lines that um, people all over the world who 
share concerns are, are mobilizing and they're aware of each other and they're talking to each other. And, and there's a lot of young people out there and, and that's what probably gives me the most hope I mean, that, that they're, they're the most active and they're really on the leading edge and, and that's what we need. And I'm, I'm happy to see that um, Standing Rock um, and the philosophies of indigenous people are, um, are, people are thinking about it in another way and people are trying to figure out how do we take it from these enclaves, these wildland type places that aren't um, connected to the way we live and bring, them in, bring these ideas into the city and figure out how to live um, in ways that, that make more sense for the earth. And these kinds of translations and cross currents are happening in all different kinds of ways. You all are making me feel a lot better. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, I, I just want to echo what um, Professor Kane just said, which is that uh, the environmental movement is certainly more diverse um, than it was 40 or 50 years ago. There's a lot more um, sort of self-recognition as um, uh, you know, uh, different forms of activism as environmental. A lot of it is more geared in um, you know, integrating this a certain type of thinking in one's everyday life and is less connected to sort of seeking these romantic escapes and so forth and so on. And I think that's really promising and so are the, the really dramatic increase in this kind of activism all around the world um, that is really locally focused and responsive to local concerns but is able to make connections and uh, invite comparisons and um, sort of share ideas with others around the world as well that um, Professor O'Reilly was just talking about. Okay, great. Now I open it back up to, to you all in the audience, such deep, thoughtful listeners of our conversation. Oh, I see waves and hands. <laughs> Anyone care to share a question? Yes, please. Okay. And there's a there's a writer um, named John Nolte. He used to be an editor of Breitbart, um, who basically who would love this film, who would say yes, absolutely. Climate change is a left wing conspiracy. The purpose, the reason why we all need to get together and say that climate change does not exist, is because the Marxists made it up to stop us from being able to. So, and obviously, like, that's crazy talk. But, but <laughs> when, when, I, when I watch a film like this, I just wonder if how we could situate it in our current political moment in a way, like, so it's a problem that we do, I think, need a collective solution for. OK, so my job is to recap that. <laughs> so I heard one key driving question at the beginning, and the rest seemed to be a bit of commentary that I'd like to reiterate, but make sure I have your, your main points here. Um, so your, your interest is in climate change denial and deniers, and, and your, your main question seemed to be, what's the motivation there? What's that there about? Um, so I'd like the, the uh, panel to think about that, especially with the, vit the vit vitriolic kind of energy around it. Um, you mentioned John Nolte, who's a writer um, and talks a lot about left-wing conspiracy and Marxist ideals being driven behind this climate change denying. And um, you're taking that and situating it in our, lar in our larger current political divisive times and uh, looking at sort of how to move towards solution even amongst all of that. Did I get that right? Okay, wonderful. <laughs> so I'll turn the question back about, the, I'm gonna go back to that motivation about what's there for climate change denial, if you can explore that with us. Yeah, they, I mean, climate contrarianism is really interesting. Um, and I think there are a lot of, uh, I think it's a coalition of different belief systems, sort of free market uh, um, types and 
um, evangelical Christians to whom you should uh, use the earth as it's given by God and that by using up the earth you're bringing about end times and salvation and all of that so it's just fulfilling a, a destiny so there are all kinds of tropes about that and that is something true about Naomi Klein that she is she's uh, she's speaking to a particular group I think and so I just wanted to um, talk a little about there are some really uh, interesting scientists and um, communicators doing that sort of bridging work um, and I just want to point out a couple of them uh, Catherine Hayhoe she's an evangelical climate scientist in Texas um, and she you know she'll go to evangelical churches and talk about climate change and she'll cut off the length or the age of the earth to 6,000 years because that doesn't matter and it actually makes the increase look more dramatic anyways and we don't need to get into that debate as well um, <laughs> and she is all over the place she's got a podcast called climate weirding um, where she's really trying to speak to uh, skeptics or, or or contrarians so she's really trying to bridge that um, and then another, uh, Merchants of Doubt, it's a book and a documentary film um, uh, written by Na the other Naomi, Naomi Oreskes, and it uh, connects uh, tobacco, the tobacco lobby, and their sort of refutate, or trying to raise doubt about the um, safety or harms of smoking, and how many of those people also then became, uh, they started working for Heartland Institute and became uh, lobbyists uh, for for climate denial as well. So there's sort of a, a long history, and some of the some of the threads you're pulling on, I think, are are part of it. Um, but you know, most people don't aren't like you know, most climate deniers aren't like really really angry all the time about it. They they perhaps just haven't been engaged in in conversation. And so I really admire those those people who are trying to bridge those. Yeah, and just one note on that. Um, we found the Yale Climate Change Communication Group doing research, and one of the ways they have uh, segmented the population, it's, it's not just black or white. It's not just the alarmists and the deniers. There's a whole spectrum of, of the audience in terms of how they respond to climate change, from alarmist to concerned to cautious to um, doubtful, all the way to, to, to dismissive. And that speaks to their level of interest in activism. And what's interesting about that, that framework is the alarmists are very committed, and the deniers are very committed and activist-oriented. But all this huge swath of people in the middle aren't necessarily. Mm -hmm. I got to say, I get really impatient with ideological battles where humans are fighting with each other about stuff that, don't, that doesn't matter because it's all going to come to a crashing halt. But um, <laughs> I think it's a really interesting time for science because as much as it's being threatened, it's really going to prove itself because the fact is that science is great because it really empirically looks at the world, at what's happening. And, and I do feel like the Earth will speak back, and I'm, I'm hoping that the, the Earth has enough compassion for us humans that it will um, allow us to continue to uh, exist um, despite these fools that we have amongst us. <laughs> Let me just echo something there. I think Mother Nature really doesn't care, frankly. Um, it's going to march on with or without us, and I hope it's with us. I'll just add one thing, um, which is that I, I, I think part of the reason why you've seen such this, such a big uptick in um, this climate denialism is in part because of this migration of um, doubt-producing skeptics that um, Oreskes and Conway have documented from um, the anti-smoking campaigns in the 70s and so forth and so on. Um, but it's... It, it's in part a reading on the part of the denialists of what taking climate change seriously would mean. And that is to say, um, uh, you know, in a policy sense, regulation, in a more broader philosophical sense, it means limitation. And if you truly believe that the purpose of um, government is to get out of the way so that individuals can maximize their liberty as expressed in the marketplace, any attempt to curtail that or corral that to put stints on um, what people can do is going to clash philosophically, right? And so it's a reading not necessarily of climate change itself, but the implications for what the policy will mean. OK. So we have time for about one more question. Yeah. Looking at the film, especially the scenes in Beijing with all the pollution, it occurred to me that uh, how, would, how 
How would solar panels work in such a place? Yeah, <laughs> I'm just wondering. Well, the sun can't get there, and then, would there be some kind of zoning? Okay, the polluter, the pollution smog <laughs> areas are over here, and the solar is over here. Or zoning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, very practical question. <laughs> um, so, in watching the film, there were some scenes uh, in Beijing and the, the pollution and the smog. Uh, so, the question is about how would solar panels work in that type of situation? And would there be different zoning areas for, like, smog areas? Or you can do solar over here because it's not as much smog, that sort of thing. So, uh, so I turn that to the panel. How, how would Yeah, that I mean, work? let me just say that it, the, the logic, I can, I can see your logic clearly. Uh, very dusty environments make it difficult to generate the efficiencies that solar panels can provide um, in sort of the best case scenario. So there's definitely declines in efficiencies for solar production under those circumstances. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Well, we have time for one more quick one. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry, could you speak up just a little? I couldn't hear that. Uh, uh, President Trump just has repealed the clean water rule, uh, which turns you know, small rivers and streams. And uh, you get the reason that uh, ranchers and farmers have been just kind of thorn in their side for the years and have exposed the cost of billions of dollars. But then I hear on democracy now, it's really a big interest. Okay, I'd like to repeat the question just so that yeah. others, everybody Probably can hear. Can so um, the issue is about water rights and the recent Trump decision to repeal um, uh, the, stream rule. the stream rule. Thank you. <laughs> That's it, the more appropriate word for it. Um, the reasoning being that the ranchers and farmers are opposed is what the, the rationale of Trump, um, but there, it seems to be more of a larger agricultural issue, and he asked for Professor Kane to respond, okay. or, and others, if you like. Yeah, well, it's a disaster for us, and we all need to be really concerned. And of course, it's way more than the ranchers, and the and it, you know they, they just fit his image of America. So you know, um, but it's the cafos, the, the 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 you know the big pig glots in the coal industry, and you know all the the industries that will, although they were already dirtying the water, they'll just be able to do it out in the open and sing songs about it, I guess, you know. I don't have a good answer. Jeff, you probably could come up with a better answer than me. Well, I'm not sure that there is an answer. It's happening, and I think it's part of his uh, larger strategy to dismantle what he believes to be overreach on the part of the of, uh, federal government. And this is just one of, I think, probably a, a good number of these kinds of actions. Okay. So that's all we have time for. Any other last comments or everybody feeling complete for the night? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thanks for bringing us thank together. You. Yeah, well, thank, you to, uh, thank you to IU Cinema for having yes. this and part of our Science of Film. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Have a wonderful night.